We welcome Alex Potterwhite in a uh, little bit of brief background. He is a regional sales manager for, for Menard USA. He design, build, geotechnical contractor specializing in ground improvement. He has a BSD from Case Western Reserve University and is a licensed professional engineer in 10 states, including Minnesota. He currently serves as the chair of the Illinois sector of the GEO Institute. Props there. Uh, in his 12 years with Menard, Alex has numerous roles within the company. He, had, he began as a site engineer and estimator, then spent seven years in the firm's design department. He has served as the engineer of record for over 50 soil improvement projects, totaling millions of square feet of treated ground. Out of Menard's Chicago office, he currently manages pursuits, pursuit efforts for future opportunities across the Midwest. Welcome, Alex. Thank you. All right, we're going to get this figured out. All right, I'm just going to trust that people on, on, online can hear me. But uh, no, thank you, everyone, for uh, coming out tonight. I uh, really appreciate it. I'm glad to be uh, back here. I think I was here maybe three or four years ago to talk about Nine Mile Creek in Edina. Um, so uh, tonight's going to be a, uh, another uh, Collins Board and Embankment case history. Um, we're going to talk about rigid inclusions, uh, something near and dear to my heart. Um, uh, so some similarities with, you know, maybe some things you've seen in the past for, for those who might have been here before, but uh, very different kind of design philosophy and different considerations for this project. Um, so we'll get into some of those differences, but also kind of review just some, some overview of, you know, comp support embankments as well. Um, so again, thanks for being here and I'll uh, get it going. And I don't think this will take too long. I'm not going to drone on. So there'll be be plenty of time for asking questions at the end. Um, unless uh, if, if you want to ask something in the end that, that works too, I'm not actually advancing anything. Oh, just the mic is in the wrong spot. All right, it's okay, it's working now. All right, so uh, just an uh, overview what are, what we'll be uh, talking about today. I'm gonna start with some project overview, look at the soil profile for this case history, um, just give some overview of columns boarded embankments. We'll talk about the design philosophy, uh, and then one the, you know the reason I kind of really wanted to present this project is there was a lot of uh, great instrumentation on this so we'll look at the results and compare it to the design that's always fun as a designer to actually be able to do that in some detail and then draw some conclusions um, at the end and then again we'll have some time for some questions. All right, so this is going to be the I 35 uh, flyover project um, so that consists of uh, a bridge replacement for the northbound I-35W crossing over the southbound uh, I-35 East. Um, as you can see here in uh, near Forest Lake, I think near the border of Anoka and Washington County. <clears throat> uh, so again, the bridge approach, uh, we're not gonna talk too much about the bridge itself. This is gonna be the approach embankments and the potential settlements uh, uh, at, the, at the approach embankments uh, as you lead up to the bridge. All right, so quick soil profile. Um, this was uh, uh, AET was the, uh, the geotech for this project, um, working for, for MnDOT. Um, so this is uh, a uh, glacial till soil profile, um, but about 20, 25 to 30 feet, I'd say about 28 feet on average, where you had a fairly compressible sandy loam, uh, plastic, uh, fairly plastic loam, which had some uh, decent compressibility, but also the strength really wasn't wasn't so wasn't so bad. So there was actually uh, uh, enough stability to to support this uh, about a thirty foot uh, tall uh, wall. But the concern for this project was, was going to be settlement, which we'll look at in a minute. So uh, had some strength between thirteen hundred to seventeen hundred psf for that loam, uh, and then the 
there was an interesting layer, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a minute, which was actually a water bearing sand layer beneath that, which caused some uh, issues for the design. Uh, and then beneath that, about 25 feet of medium dense sand before you got to some really dense uh, uh, sandy till uh, at, at depth, not shown in the uh, CPT profile. This is kind of a typical uh, CPT right near the, the bridge. Uh, so just a cross section, this is at one of the approach embankments, you have the uh, proposed MSE wall, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit, kind of right up against the uh, existing bridge on one side and then a slope on the other side where there wasn't any uh, you know, land constraints. You could just build the slope out into some uh, free space uh, on the side of the road. Um, as I mentioned, with the, the, the shear strengths and the overconsolidation of that loam, there actually was an inherently stable condition. So maybe not your uh, immediate thought is, do, do we really need ground improvement? Uh, can we just build this embankment, uh, let it settle out, and, uh, and then pave once you know, the, the, the settlement has occurred? So that was certainly a consideration. I'll talk about you know, why that, that was not selected ultimately uh, as the, uh, the project's uh, path forward. Uh, there was a, a strict settlement criteria on this one. There was a, uh, what's kind of a terminology I learned on this project, the unbonded overlay, which led to some strict settlement criteria, which I'll show here at the, uh, in zone one, so the core of the embankment uh, for this project, the project settlement criteria was, uh, I think it was from the end of the, the paving to the end of the warranty period, um, which was, I think, I think about three years. Um, less than a half inch of deflection. So just you know, put that in between your fingers and think about a 30 foot tall wall, settle, you know, limiting that amount of settlement to a half inch uh, over, over a, a fairly lengthy period of time. Um, that starts to you know, change some of the considerations about whether we can just build this and not, not do anything. Um, some different criteria at the slopes that didn't really end up governing. It's really about the uh, uh, the settlement criteria at the pavement elevation, uh, which was the, uh, the governing criteria. Um, so uh, what are our options? You know, with, uh, if we build this and, and don't do anything, uh, you know, AET's analysis was, you know, you're gonna have to wait forever to, to actually be able to pave this road. You're not gonna be able to put traffic on it fast enough and it's, the project would be dead in the water. So first thought is, can we, can we overbuild this? Can we surcharge it? Uh, and get enough settlement out so that you don't need to uh, <clears throat> wait an excessive amount of time. So that was certainly considered, but if you can, I don't know if you can read that, but the, uh, you know, over at the end, that's 200 days on the right side, if you can't see that in the back. Um, so still certainly some settlement happening after, you know, six, uh, six seven months. Um, with a surcharge, you know, you're, ex uh, you're getting more of that settlement out in advance, obviously. Um, but still some, some potential issues. This, this actually uh, station is not necessarily in the ground improvement zone, but similar behavior with that same plastic sandy loam uh, layer. So uh, what's the, you know, maybe the next thought is, uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with wick drains. So it's basically a vertical uh, uh, plastic drain wrapped in a geotextile, uh, uh, which you, you install that vertically uh, you know, typically an excavator base, uh, you know, with a mandrel, you stick it vertically in the ground. It's a, it's a fast, cheap process, and you can significantly accelerate your, uh, your settlement period with that process. But we're going to talk about why that was not necessarily the preferred approach uh, in a minute. Um, but the third option was a uh, column-supported embankment, which is what I'm going to be presenting, was ultimately selected. Um, by the, the DOT as the preferred route forward. Uh, and I'll give an overview of, of what that entails. So uh, there was, this was a design build project. So different teams were able to present, you know, what they thought was the best approach geotechnically for the project and in other aspects as well, outside of the, the geotechnical approach. Um, so I, I mentioned that uh, about three to five foot layer beneath the plastic loam which was a water bearing or artesian uh, sand layer. So when AET did their uh, drilling and sampling, they noticed you know, significant rises in the water level uh, as they were encountering that layer. Um, so with uh, a wick drain, you know, the, the term wick drain is actually kind of a, a misnomer. 
Um, it's a wick drain doesn't actually typically wick water up from uh, you know the groundwater table up to the surface. Its intention is just to take the excess pore water pressure to the surface uh, that occurs naturally during settlement, um, and then it can be drained off uh, where needed. Um, but in a, a artesian condition, there's potential that you actually would be taking that that excess pressure from the the groundwater table and actually creating a situation that you you don't necessarily want where you're kind of inundating the being uh, around uh, and taking it somewhere else. So the wick drains were were not a preferred approach on this. Then Menard did not, you know, Menard designs and installed wick drains. We were, were not interested in, in kind of getting into that uh, scenario on this project. Um, so we went a different approach. Uh, a couple of the partners on this project, uh, we worked with uh, uh, with AET uh, on this. And uh, actually, I think I, I misspoke or I, I don't, I think the DOT, the borings initially were the DOT borings. I think AET was actually on the design build team with, uh, with Menard and Enrico and the contractor on this was, uh, was Schaefer contracting. Um, so we proposed a column supported embankment, uh, no wick drains uh, to uh, reduce the overall settlement and then also inherently therefore reduce the post-construction settlement. Um, that was ultimately selected by the DOT as the preferred approach uh, for the uh, for the project. Um, so uh, Menard was brought on board to do the design and construction of the columns port embankment. Uh, so just, uh, I think probably a lot of you are familiar with the concept of columns port embankments, but just a quick overview. Um, so the, uh, the basic concept, you have a grid of vertical inclusions. It can be made out of you know, different types of things. Uh, can be a concrete inclusion. Uh, Stone columns are, I think, technically considered a, a type of inclusion for columns port embankments. I don't necessarily think that that falls in the same category uh, because a stone column uh, has a uh, strain compatibility with the surrounding soil. So when you load a, a stone column, it will bulge out uh, proportionally to the, uh, the, the settlement of the soil between it. So essentially a stone column improved soil is is like a one composite soil mass so it's it's almost like you're just treating the soil in situ rather than uh installing a vertical inclusion which can settle differentially to the soil around it so i'll, I'll explain that in a little more detail in a minute uh certainly pile supported embankments are a type of you know column supported embankment um but the key to you know any sort of uh, csc system is you you need some sort of load transfer platform some mechanism to make sure that the uh, sufficient amount of uh, stress is transferred into the, the tops of the columns uh, and a reduced amount of stress is transferred into the soil between the columns. Uh, that load transfer platform can be reinforced with the geosynthetic to enhance that load transfer and improve stability, uh, but it doesn't necessarily need to be. And there's certainly different uh, methods of designing these uh, columns board embankment systems I'll be showing the uh, finite element method uh, of analysis in this uh, case history. So in terms of the, the types of inclusions, uh, I'll be focusing in on uh, Menard's kind of trademark version of it, which is a displacement drilled grouted column uh, known as a controlled modulus column um, or generically as a rigid inclusion. So typically installed with a, you know, a <clears throat> track based drill rig with a displacement drilling auger, uh, which is mounted to a, uh, it has a, you know, a hollow tube inside of it. So you can pour grout as you're withdrawing the, the auger once you've hit a solid bearing layer. Uh, so pretty simple illustration here. Um, but one of the keys is that the, uh, the third point here, the, the rigid inclusion system or your, your, your grid of inclusion should always be designed, you know, in concert with the, the load transfer platform system. So that, the, the spacing diameter depth of your columns uh, is going to affect uh, what the, the, the demand on your load transfer platform and, and vice versa. So the thickness reinforcement uh, and uh, material composition of your load transfer platform uh, is, is going to be dependent on your inclusions. Uh, the 
And just a note on the load transfer platform, typically like a compacted gravel, you know, like in, in Minnesota, a class five type material is pretty common. Um, and reinforcement can, can vary uh, with uh, geosynthetic type and strength depending on the demand. All right, so just a little illustration here. I'll kind of step through it. So if we have a, just a simple uh, graphic here, a uniform load, in this case, it'll be an embankment, but it could be a building or a slab uh, where you have uh, shear transfer into the tops of the columns through what we call arching. The reason we call it arching is the, if you look at the principal stress arrows, uh, you'll, it'll sort of form a, an arch, which, which points towards the, uh, the columns, depending on where you're at in the thickness of the load transfer platform. And you're going to put most of that load into the tops of the columns, but some amount of that load is going to get into the soil between the columns. You're not forming a completely rigid system here. So there will be some load that gets into that, that soft soil in between the columns, um, which as a result of that amount, that settlement that occurs in the upper portion of your soft layer will cause some down drag onto your columns and some uh, skin friction. So your, your maximum load in your column actually doesn't occur at the top. It occurs somewhere in the middle of your soft layer. Um, so you can't necessarily account, you can't count on the entire skin frictional uh, capacity of your column. You can only account on the, uh, the portion that's beneath what we call our neutral point of your, uh, of your column. And I'll show some instrumentation to show just how, uh, just how real that skin friction loading is uh, in, in actual uh, um, uh, results. So just a quick overview of CMC projects in the US. I, I think there's a few missing here, but this is fairly up to date. Um, you can see, you know, a cluster around the Twin Cities, certainly a good amount around Chicago, and then a, a ton on the, the East Coast where you've got uh, a lot of uh, uh, bridge inclusion projects to support embankments and walls in uh, New Jersey and the Mid-Atlantic. So uh, getting the design, um, so find an element design, there's, uh, you kind of start with a unit cell analysis, uh, just look at one column and its surrounding area uh, to get an idea of spacing, depth, diameter. But then once you have that kind of honed in, you can start looking at a more advanced uh, 2D plane strain or three-dimensional finite element analysis. So you actually uh, cut a slice across the, uh, across the embankment. You've got your uh, MSE wall here. Uh, and the columns aren't shown, but they're actually modeled as, you know, stiff, stiff inclusions uh, vertically uh, within the profile. Um, the prediction for this project was uh, about three inches of maximum settlement, uh, including settlement during construction, um, but then meeting that half inch uh, criteria after the, uh, the waiting period. This was going to be built over the, uh, in the fall with uh, a waiting period over the winter. Or, or maybe in the summer with the waiting period over the winter after construction. Um, and then, uh, so that's your vertical settlement. We're also looking uh, in the horizontal direction. You don't wanna put additional stress onto your wall or put too much lateral stress onto your perimeter columns. Uh, so each, um, each column was analyzed for, to make sure you have enough you know, bending capacity. Uh, and in fact, uh, the edge rows here, um, because there's not a lot of vertical load on those edge columns because there's really nothing above it. Um, the, there's not as much resistance to lateral uh, stress. So the, actually the, we did have to reinforce these edge columns uh, with, a, with a centralized uh, steel bar uh, to make sure there wasn't the uh, cracking in that column. Even though not, not a lot of tension, just about 70, 70 PSI in that edge column, but better safe than sorry. Um, so final design after that final element analysis, about a 12-inch uh, layer of that class five to serve as a working platform for the equipment, but then it also gets incorporated into what's ultimately our load transfer platform, and then an additional uh, 30 inches of that compacted class five on top of that, and that's all you know beneath your uh, MSE wall, uh, which again is about 30 feet tall uh, on top of that grid of inclusions and that load transfer platform. Um, the the columns went, uh, you know, really only as far into the uh, embankment uh, slope as was required for, uh, you know, that settlement criteria, criteria at, the, at the top um, with the, the lesser criteria at the edges of the uh, uh, embankment slopes. Uh, so some pictures uh, from 
and just some notes about the construction. You can see there was uh, sheeting uh, there to hold back the uh, existing embankment material. So definitely getting up close to that 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 sheeting and uh, putting a, a you know a challenge in for our field guys to get that coordinated. Uh, so that's always fun. But uh, about 400 columns were installed in a matter of a few weeks. Um, there was also you know just as a construction consideration. Uh, because the columns were going in before the bridge piles, the, the rigid inclusions were reinforced in the proximity of those bridge piles just to make sure that they weren't damaged due to the vibrations during installation of those bridge piles. So just something to think about for uh, future works. Um, can also go you know, in reverse, you know, whichever uh, method, way you uh, install you know, sequence wise, there's always gonna be some amount of coordination required to make sure that there's no damage to you know, either type of system uh, as, as they're being installed. And that you have proper access uh, to all your columns. If you have uh, bridge piles that are sticking up way out of the ground, uh, that obviously makes it harder to move a drill rig uh, around it to get your columns uh, in the ground. Uh, another picture here, you can see the, um, the ready mix uh, being fed into a pump, which then gets fed through a hose up to the, the top of the tooling and is then installed uh, uh, through the tooling as, as the uh, auger is being withdrawn. Uh, for that artesian condition I mentioned, um, there was some concern of uh, water uh, actually intruding into the, the columns themselves and causing a loss of integrity. So there were uh, admixtures that were developed, you know, specifically for this project to make sure that that, um, that didn't occur. And we really saw no issues with bleed water or anything like that on this project. So uh, it was a good instance of, you know, planning in advance for, for your uh, dialing in your mix design to make sure you don't have uh, issues with uh, loss of strength due to the, the geotechnical conditions. Um, this is a, an example of a uh, computer profile for one of the columns that was installed. This is actually the load test column. So a sacrificial column, which then serves as the, uh, the minimum criteria for all the production columns. So as long as the load test column passes, uh, all of the, uh, the production columns should be installed with a similar or better embedment into that bearing layer. So for this project, I don't know exactly what the embedment criteria is, but you see you have a, a torque graph here. So an example of a, a potential minimum criteria would have been, uh, looks like maybe eight feet into uh, at above 80 kip feet of torque. So as long as each of your production columns are installed with at least that much embedment at that level of torque, uh, you will, uh, you. Uh, that's an acceptable column for the project as long as the load test passes. And I just broke up the profile here. You can see once you hit that sand layer, your torque starts to increase and your, let's see, do we have the, the speed? Yeah, the speed starts to decrease here as well. Um, so you're getting more resistance uh, that's observed by the drill rig and by the driller. Uh, and then you can terminate in that, that medium dense sand layer. Uh, the load test results. So this was actually a a little, uh, a little boo-boo uh, on our part. We had the calibration just a little bit off. Uh, we were shooting to get up a little bit higher on the load, but the, because the calibrations were not exactly correct, we only were able to get to about, I think, 140% uh, on the, uh, the initial test. So there was a, a retest of that same column. So uh, obviously did, you know, did a little bit better on the retest, but even when you add in the, you know, the little bit of set from the first column still, still meeting the, the predicted tip response uh, from the, the design models um, compared to the load test. Um, so it's a successful test. Um, also, you know, always recommend looking at uh, strain gauge data within your load test column. So uh, for a uniformly loaded area, as I mentioned before, uh, your maximum load isn't going to occur at the top of your column. So you wanna make sure you have sufficient load that's actually made it to the uh, your neutral point in your load test. Um, so the, for this project, uh, we were confirming that uh, I think the, the neutral point was maybe somewhere in here, or uh, maybe we just needed to make sure it made it to the top of the bearing layer uh, down at this elevation. Um, but you can see uh, based on this uh, strain gauge graph that uh, you're seeing a good amount of load shed in that upper fill. You had some dense fill in some areas, so you're seeing a good amount of uh, load shed in that layer, but then this uh, plastic sandy loam layer where you've got more compressible soil, you're not seeing as much load shed. So this, the, the, 
uh, the curve of this graph takes a significant uh, change here. And then once again, you're back into the sand from uh, 38 to 41 feet, and you've got quite a bit of a load shed again in that really good sand layer at depth. So this is pretty much exactly what you want to see in your, your strain gauge graph, you know, something that matches your, your soil profile. Um, so this is uh, uh, after the, uh, the columns we're in, just kind of continuing with construction of the uh, the new bridge, you know, adjacent to the, the, existing, uh, the existing ramp bridge there. Um, so going to get a little bit into the instrumentation now. This is uh, what we call, I think it was Nest G. Um, AET did the instrumentation on this. So there was uh, a horizontal shape array uh, here. Um, so basically a string of uh, accelerometers, you know, every, every foot uh, to measure the uh, the deflection uh, as you uh, uh, progress, you know, across the, the length of one run of uh, rigid inclusions. Uh, let's see, I think we have a zoomed in view here. Yep. So in addition to that, that horizontal shape array also have a uh, vertical uh, inclinometer and uh, some strain gauges and some columns and some uh, earth pressure cells as well. Uh, another view here. Uh, where you've got uh, just, uh, an, uh, again, your shape array, your strain gauges in your columns, your earth pressure cells uh, uh, on the top of the, the columns versus uh, in between the columns. So you can see the stress directly above the columns versus the stress in between the columns and what that difference is. So some of the results. I'm only going to look at just one of the two walls. Um, so I've put some... Uh, some vertical lines here. So these yellow lines are the approximate locations. Uh, you cut a cross section across the area. The yellow lines are the uh, locations of the, the rigid inclusions. Uh, the, the blue is the, uh, the MSE wall. There's actually, I think I maybe, oh, yep. I, uh, there's one more outside in front of the, the MSE wall there. Um, so we actually did on this on this side of the wall. Uh, even I, I'm choosing to show this one. We did see a little bit actually more than predicted in some spots in terms of settlement. I think the other side we maybe saw a little bit less, but this was a little more interesting, you know, geotechnically. So the two uh, columns in red that were highlighted were actually the two that were instrumented with the strain gauges. Um, so if you notice here, the um, the shape array was placed basically directly, uh, you know, it's a horizontal inclinometer placed directly, you know, basically over top of the column. I think there was about a six inch gap between the, the elevation of the tops of the columns versus the elevation of the inclinometer. So a little bit of a softening, but really not much. So you'll see that the, uh, the results, you know, and these are over time. So this is at about nine months after construction, which is right about when it started to kind of level off. Um, at each column location, you pretty much see that there's a spike. So the, the deflection actually goes up. So the, at, think about a point directly above the top of your column, you're gonna see less deflection because you have a hard point there. But then once you get to the top of the, the load transfer platform, which isn't shown, you will see a much more level uh, deflection because you've got an extra two and a half feet of compacted gravel to level out that deflection. But you'll see at each column location, you've got that spike in the, uh, the deflection, which is exactly what you want to see. Um, but what's interesting is the, the two that were instrumented here, uh, you don't see really that spike. So I think, and that's where you see your maximum predicted settlement. So maybe those were maybe a little bit overloaded compared to what we expected um, based on the stress distribution, but, but still, you know, decent agreement. Again, a little bit more right in front of the, or right behind the MSC wall than expected. Um, so this red line is the predicted settlement. Uh, from the from the model versus the actual uh, settlement here. Um, so now looking at the loads in the columns, this was uh, one of those two instrumented columns. These are the strain gauges at uh, four different depths. You have the, uh, the surface where you're starting to get some load in the top of the column. Your load is increasing over time uh, as you get uh, lower in the column due to that skin friction that I mentioned. And then you get to about a maximum of 140 kips uh, here at your around your neutral point. And then uh, not really sure what happened here. Fairly low load at the tip, basically. So you did see a lot of load shedding out of the column in that sand layer. It, 
I'm not sure if it got damaged, but it did show like a little bit of tension in the tip. Uh, that wouldn't really be expected. Um, but basically, main point is this this one column looked exactly like what we expected. Um, then the one next to it didn't really make sense uh, but first. Um, we did see much higher stresses uh, in this column. Um, so kind of had to do a little bit of uh, calibration to get to um, what you know, maybe is a more reasonable stress level. So what we did to do that calibration is we looked at the earth pressure cells. So we had two earth pressure cells directly over top of columns and then one in between uh, the columns. So this, this uh, is the, the stress level in between your columns. So you're riding at about 1400 PSF. It's maybe slightly lowering uh, over time. Uh, which makes sense because you're gradually getting a little bit more load into the columns and load away from the, the soil. Um, and then here's your load in the two, uh, directly above the, the two CMCs that are instrumented. So uh, certainly seeing a, a high amount of stress concentration directly above those, those hard points. Um, so we use those loads uh, to kind of calibrate to maybe a more reasonable uh, curve. And we see about uh, 182 kips, which is still a little bit more than we, we designed for, and maybe that explains the, the higher deflection in that, in that one isolated location. But either way, this is probably a more realistic uh, curve. So hard to know, maybe this uh, column had a little bit different stiffness than we assumed. Uh, maybe there were some variations of diameter, um, but either way, 180 kips is probably more reasonable than like 600 kips or whatever I showed earlier. Um, just uh, thought it was an interesting, uh, Kind of comparison there. So one last uh, uh, piece of the instrumentation is that lateral deflection that I mentioned earlier. That was an important part of our design prediction is making sure that the, the edge columns weren't overstressed and that the MSC wall wasn't going to push out further than uh, that could be tolerated by the manufacturer. Um, so in the orange, you have the, uh, the predicted lateral deflection. So that's, that's here. Um, and then at, and that's at the exact location, you know, in our model that the actual inclinometer was installed. And then this is the uh, actual results over time. So pretty similar curve overall. We did see a little bit less lateral deflection um, compared to the prediction, which is good. Um, and then again, kind of normalizing back to zero as you get deeper along the length of the column. Uh, sorry, this is, this depth is in meters. So that's actually like, you're getting towards the tip of the column here as you're uh, starting to normalize at your, you know, zero or close to zero lateral deflection. Um, but uh, yeah, overall, I think, uh, you know, we did see on one side of the bridge a little bit more uh, localized deflection, but overall, you know, the, um, the, the magnitudes were kind of in the same range and we, we did see that leveling off over time of that settlement to allow for the, you know, the pavement of the, the road as scheduled, you know, after the waiting period. Um, there was certainly, uh, you know, less, less risk of an extended uh, waiting period. Uh, if you think about um, uh, putting a lower stress level uh, into your, uh, your sandy loam, your plastic loam layer, you're actually not only reducing your overall consolidation, but you're, you know, generally uh, also keeping it in a, a recompression state, which tends to occur uh, not only at a lower magnitude, but also at a uh, faster rate. So you're actually kind of inherently accelerating the settlement there. Um, but uh, yeah, in general, a fairly good agreement between the prediction uh, and, the, and the actual results. Uh, we've had some, I think the last time I was here, we talked about all the instrumentation at Nine Mile Creek. Uh, always, you know, happy to work with MnDOT and, and get the opportunity to, to do some cool things with the instrumentation program. And we're really happy to work with AET on this one. And uh, overall, the comms port embankment, you know, worked well, uh, served its function, and uh, it was a successful project. Um, construction moved forward. And uh, uh, continue to monitor the instrumentation. I only showed the first nine months, but uh, there really wasn't too much interesting after that. Um, and uh, yeah, no one's called us about it since, so that's usually a good thing. <laughs> but uh, again, yeah, I'm really uh, uh, glad to, that you all came out. I know everyone's uh, busy these days. I, I know you guys are just getting back to in person. I'm glad that we have some people online as well. Uh, 
I'm going to put in a uh, shameless uh, plug as well for uh, uh, we're putting on, uh, as I mentioned, or uh, was mentioned earlier, we're putting on a, uh, uh, I'm part of the Illinois Geotechnical Institute and we're putting on a one day conference in, in May. So if anyone uh, uh, finds uh, themselves down in that area uh, every so often, uh, should be a good uh, chance to get some PDHs and uh, see some of your colleagues in, in that area. Um, so kind of similar to, I think, what you guys put on here a few weeks ago at uh, University of Minnesota, um, have some uh, exhibiting opportunities as well. But uh, didn't want to forget to mention that. But one last thing, I did want to thank MnDOT, AET, Schaefer, a uh, really great team to be working with on this project. And uh, hope we get opportunity to you know, work with all these people again. And uh, yeah, I just uh, want to thank everybody again and happy to answer some questions.